This morning with confession and forgiveness, which is found on page two in your bulletin. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Called by the Holy Spirit and gathered in this place together this morning, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. We have not the walls instead of tables and turned away the stranger. We have sought glory for ourselves and have treasured that which does not satisfy. Help us to love as you love, to welcome those you send, and to treasure mercy and justice. Turn us from our ways to your ways, and free us to serve those in need. Amen. God, who makes all things new, forgives your sins, for Jesus' sake. And God remembers them no more. So lift up your heads and your hearts. Yours is the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. in my family, and all of you know veterans, and I wanted to appreciate them. Uh, and so I sort of tried to come up with a way to do that. So out in the narthex, there is a, a big piece of paper, and we can write down uh, the names of veterans that we're thinking of. And uh, we'll keep that as a way just to honor them a little bit during our worship today. Uh, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we give you thanks for the men and women who have served and defended our country and the values of freedom and justice that we hold so dear. We ask, gracious God, that you would help us be mindful of the sacrifices they have made and the hardship endured by their families and friends. And we ask this so that we may never take for granted the privileges that they have secured for us. Hear us as we gather for worship and as we pray together through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Could it be that I, 
get too overwhelmed by all the stuff that comes at me at once. So I just build these little illusions and I try to think that that's the way the world look, works. Could it be that those are fragile and that we have been dazzled by the illusion of what we've constructed, made for ourselves? Could this be I-L-L-U-S-I-O-N? In the 13th chapter of Mark, Jesus has just left the temple. I'm going to give you an idea of what the temple looked like when Jesus walked past. It was completely covered. The walls, everything was completely covered in gold. It was said to be so bright that if you looked at it in the middle of the sun, uh, it, would bl- it was almost blinding to look at. It. But Israel, Jerusalem, where Jesus is, was so chaotic. They were not happy. They were upset. Everybody had all these different groups. Everybody's upset with everybody else. Uh, There was an occupying power in their nation that did not let them do all of the things that they would like to do. They weren't really all that free. But at least they had the temple, this gold thing that sort of was an illusion. I-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. Could it be that we have been dazzled by our own illusions. I don't want to just think about the temple. I want to think about how this affects us today. So that's a historical thing, and that's Jesus addressing it, and about stuff coming down, illusions coming down. But I want to think about this today. And I thought of seven stories to tell to try to get to this. Is that a lot, seven stories? How much time do you all have? That's probably too many, right? Seven. So then I had to figure out how can I whittle this down, and I couldn't figure I couldn't figure out how to do it. So we'll see how this works. Uh, I just put them all in a basket, and we'll pull one out. All right. I have no idea which one's going to come out. I'll talk about the bigger one when we get to Bob. You're always getting the wrong one. Although the danger is that Bob has the rules. He's going to be like a child. Just for now, just the one. talk to you for a minute about uh, the absolute pinnacle and how to me this is uh, one way to think about how we've been dazzled by grandeur. okay? What do you think is the absolute pinnacle of human creativity? You don't have to say it out loud, just think about this. What is to you the absolute pinnacle of creativity, the best thing that's ever been invented that shows how wonderful we are as humans? Do you have an idea of what you think it is? I have two things that I think it is. The first is cream sticks. I think cream sticks are the pinnacle of human creativity. There are chocolate ones, there are vanilla ones, and these are the best creation ever. I don't eat so many of them now, but to me, this is the pinnacle. We reached the pinnacle when we invented these. This is the pinnacle of human creativity, right? And the second is just under it. I don't eat very many of these anymore. Uh, but I've eaten in my life thousands and thousands of gummy bears, right? So these, to me, uh, these are pure sugar. These are the pinnacle of human creation. Cream sticks, gummy bears. Have any of you, what did you think of? You want to say it out loud, what did you think of? Do you know what people went and did with cream sticks? We had vanilla, we had chocolate, and then they made what to me is a total abomination. Maple. We had reached the pinnacle of human creativity with cream sticks. We had vanilla, we had chocolate, and then people, I don't know, just thought they had to keep going with it, and now we have maple. They have now taken gummy bears, and I think those are like 100% sugar, 
And they've made sugar-free gummy bears. It's just totally manufactured ingredients. And I'm not going to go too far into this, but if you Google sugar-free gummy bears, and you see all the reviews of the people that have eaten that and what happens to them, the hint that I'll give you is that you have to be really close to a bathroom after you've eaten those. This is abomination. We've taken the absolute pinnacle and turned it into stuff that is just completely mixed up and completely uh, taken those things and messed them up. And so maybe the first illusion is, the first thing out of all these stories, the one we picked, is that sometimes you and I believe in our own creativity, in our own inventiveness, in how great technology or baking or whatever can be. Sometimes we have a lot of faith in people to continue to invent and great and make great things. And then sometimes we get very upset when people take those things and maybe don't do with them as much as we hope for them to do. And maybe this is one of the illusions that we live in, that something technological or baked or put together is great enough to sort of see us through. Maybe we have a lot of confidence in what other people will do with these things. And maybe sometimes we come sort of face to face with our illusions and maybe we see that sometimes these are pretty difficult. So I had seven stories like this. I had seven different ones, six more to go. I won't do all six more, but one more. Are we okay with one more? Okay. Uh, I'm not coming over to Bob. I don't know what Bob will say. I'll try it all. I'm trying to hide over here. I could have done seven. I'm just doing two. Okay. 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 Okay.
but we're not quite sure we want to get to the bottom of what right, might really be happening, and so it's easier. I'm thinking of illusions and how often we are dazzled by the grandeur of things we've built, of our own way of finding meaning and belief. I'm thinking about Jesus walking by the temple, who knew that the temple system itself wasn't really what he wanted it to be. He wanted it to be something that took care of, like the widow from last week, and he didn't really do this. But it was grand and how easy it was to fall into that, and I'm thinking about this. How often you and I succumb to this. And here's what I really want to talk about. Here's the point of all that. Disillusionment is literally the loss of illusions. It's literally being taken, having illusions being taken from you. What if disillusionment is essential to your life of faith? What if disillusionment is essential to meaningful life? What if having all of our illusions taken from us is essential to living how Christ wants us to live? Loss of illusion about how capable I am. Loss of illusion about how the expectations I have on neighbors or people around me. Loss of illusion on how great all technology can be and how it will always fix everything. Loss of illusion on uh, getting this full story, the full truth from the news or from wherever else all the time. Disillusionment. What if disillusionment is essential to our life of faith? And that to me is the story of Jesus walking past the temple and talking about that temple not lasting and not always being there. And it's a story about disillusionment and I'm thinking about this. Are you to this place yet? Are you disillusioned yet? I don't know how you all feel, but I feel like disillusionment is pretty close to an explanation of where I'm at. And my question is, what if disillusionment is essential to our life of faith? What if we've been dazzled by all the things that we think we've built for ourselves? What if our way of seeing things and all the things that we've built up has sort of dazzled us and this illusion of grandeur? And what if the reason why you're here today is to sit before God earnestly and to sit in disillusionment? I believe that disillusionment is essential to our life of faith. I believe that when we're in a place of disillusionment, when we feel this, when we know it, we're exactly where God needs us to be. Where do we turn for help? Who do we pray to? Who do we ask for comfort or peace from when we're in a place of disillusionment? Uh, I said that I would do not do all seven of these stories, but one more. Are we okay with one more? I don't know what else. I keep throwing the pieces of paper back in this, which is a bad idea. Drink this black, just straight. So many of you. I believe that I like coffee, but I have to have it in such a way that by the time I fix it all up and put all the stuff in it and do it all this way, that I'm not sure it's actually coffee anymore. So every morning I have to do this, and I get up, and uh, I like to say that I like coffee, but by the time I make this, I think what I like is the illusion of a routine and the illusion of being awake, you know, like the caffeine. And I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about how often we have this life of illusion that we think we can set a routine, 
that we think uh, maybe if we get just enough caffeine or enough of the stuff we're dependent on that we can make our way through that day. And I'm thinking about all these illusions and all the things that we fit, our own temples, our own maybe even kind of places of idolatry, my own cup of coffee, because underneath all of that, I'm feeling pretty disillusioned. And my sense is that that's what Jesus is saying in today's gospel. That disillusionment, the loss of belief, confidence in all of the things that we've built up, our own routines, my own uh, dependence on caffeine or whatever it is that I want in the morning. It's probably my coffee because it's not black by the time I drink it. All of that is illusory. It's an illusion. And so I wanted to think about this with you. Could it be that we have built illusions and that we've placed a lot of confidence in them? And could this be a time of earnestness before God where we kind of know that underneath all that there's this other feeling? And I've asked you to think about it, and I've asked you to think about whether you believe this. I believe that disillusionment is exactly where God hopes for us to be. I believe that this is essential to our life of faith. It is the place where all of the other things that we hope in or put our confidence in are stripped back, they're taken away, and we sit as the people of God before the reality that's in front of us, dependent on God to help give us faith and strength to get through. In Jesus' day, the temple was so bright and so golden that when people looked at it, it was almost blind. And I was trying to think of a way, how do I talk about this with you all today? And so I thought about these illusions that we have. And it's up to you whether you believe it. I believe that disillusionment is the place where God wants us to be. That stripped of all these things, you and I are back down to just our sort of brokenness and need and who we are underneath it all. And instead of placing confidence in our cars or people's ability to make an even better cream stick or any of those things, we sit before God prayerfully hoping that after disillusionment, comes re-illusionment filled with not our own illusions but the idea of love and kindness and care mercy, justice the, the idea, the vision that God has for the world around us I-L-L-U-S-I-O-N illusion I believe we've come to this place to set those aside, to be living into our disillusionment and that this is essential to faith, and that gathered around this table together, we're asked to be re-illusioned, re-visioned for a whole new way of being. Amen. <laughs>
bulletins underneath the hymn of the day. Uh, today we are presenting Bibles to our third graders. This is a tradition that we've had here uh, for quite a while. Uh, and there's a whole process that are wrapped up in several layers of different kinds of paper, each of which sort of explain how the Bible works or tries to explain how the Bible works. Uh, that's located in your bulletins. We're doing that today at the 1030 service. So our service continues on page 8 where we join together with all of the saints in every time and in every place, and together with them confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, Spirit. He ascended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Eternal God, we hold firm amid the changes of this world. Hear us now as we pray for the church, the world, and everyone in need. God, our Creator, you show us the path of life. Bless faithful people everywhere in humility as they extend compassion to those who have experienced harm in religious spaces. of Christ be with you always. Let us share the peace. Holy God, the earth is yours, as is everything in it. Yet you have chosen to dwell among your creatures. We ask, gracious God, that you would come among us now in these gifts of bread and wine. We ask that you would strengthen us to be your body for the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcomes death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opens to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gathered into one, we are bold to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the other slips of paper in that basket says March 17th, 2019. March 17th, 2019. That is the day that most of you got a text from me that said church was closed that we weren't gathering here in person because of COVID and that the table was closed and everything was closed down. And I'll tell you that since we've tried to come back, part of the illusion for me has been what it used to look like and what it looks like now and how that is different. And that's been somewhat sort of challenging to think about. But this morning, I believe we're called to this place and gathered, gathered at this table together again not to worry about how it used to look, but filled with confidence of where God is taking us, how it's going to look. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
Thank you.